You can be seated. If you just give me about 30, 40 minutes, I'll be quick. Um, I'm not long-winded at all. You guys know that. Um, would it be okay if I teach Jesus this morning? Would that be okay? Yeah. All right, but, but before I do that, let me get to the important stuff. Your firstborn eats dirt, you rush him to the hospital. Your secondborn eats dirt, you wash his mouth out. The third child eats dirt, you wonder if they need to eat lunch too. <laughs> I got to watch my youngest son because he eats toilet paper. He'll grab that roll of toilet paper and he'll, he'll take a chunk out the side. And it ruins the whole roll, you know? I'm just glad he doesn't eat used toilet paper. <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to go. I'm sorry about that. If you want to know who loves you the most, put your wife and your dog in the trunk, and when you open the trunk, see who's the happiest to see you. I don't try that now. A recent scientific study discovered that women at, who add a few extra pounds live longer than the men who mention it. Isn't that the truth? I want to go into some heavy-duty scripture out of Matthew. It's, you know, it's a series of verses that, that uh, Jesus and his disciples, Jesus is talking to his disciples uh, in Caesarea Philippi, and um, I just want to just kind of break this down a little bit. You know, I'm all about context when I read the Bible, um, so I just want to just share a little bit of that. It's, this is going to be a loaded potato of, uh, of context here, sour cream, cheese, the chives, everything. It's going to be a loaded potato. Matthew 16, verse number 13 through 19, and it says this. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I am? Who do men say that I am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? It's one of the most important questions that you can ask yourself is who do you say that Jesus is to you? Who is he in your life? Simon Peter answered and said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus spun around and said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven title of my message this morning is the Ecclesia. Father God, we just thank you. Father God, for this moment, I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity, the honor it is to share behind this pulpit this morning. I just ask Holy Spirit that let it be your words that come out and to communicate to the uh, hearts of people in this building this morning and those listening in on uh, 100.5 and those watching on Facebook Live. I just ask, Father God, that an open heart, um, open spirit to, to receive what it is that you want them to receive this morning. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you know that everybody has a worldview? Everybody has a worldview. Whatever, wherever house you grew up in, there is a specific set of views that are a lens that you see the world through. How many know that the Christian worldview is a very unique worldview? It's very different from all the other worldviews that are out, religious worldviews that are out there. It's different from Buddhism. It's different from Islam. It's different from uh, the 220 million uh, deities that are worshipped in India and counting. It's different. It's, uh, it's, it's more... If you, if you want to break down the Christian worldview, 
And the, the Judeo worldview is very similar, but it has its limits to it. If you break it down, it's all about communion with God. Islam does not have that. Buddhism does not have that. Buddhism is actually atheistic at its core. They don't have that. What the Christian worldview and the Judeo, the Judaism worldview have is they have a worldview that, you know what? It's about communion with God. And Judaism is limited because it only goes so far with communion with God. And how many of you know that I, I was listening to a guy who, who, who does, uh, he's the um, undertaker for, um, uh, in Israel. And one of the things that he does is, is he noticed that whenever a Islamic suicide bomber blows himself up, uh, the area where his growing is is always protected by a lead girdle. That lead girdle is for him to be able to, whatever he the, the Islamic worldview is with his 200 brown-eyed virgins in heaven. So that worldview is geared towards pleasure. And it's amazing that the Judeo-Christian worldview is about communion with God. It's about a relationship. It's about relationship. It is abnormal for a Christian not to have an appetite for the impossible. It's very abnormal. It's that our Christian worldview, we see things that are impossible. And you know what? There is something that triggers on the inside of us that, you know what? I can do that. If God is with me on the inside, if he has called me to do something uh, for my generation that seems impossible, you know what? The appetite of, of the God inside of me increases exponentially. And it's been written into our spiritual DNA that, you know what? That might be impossible, but you know what? With God on the inside of me, I can do it. For, for the impossibilities around us, they have to bow down to the name of Jesus. Every single principality, power, impossibility, one day or the next is going to bow down to the name of Jesus. And this day or the next. Amen? So Matthew 28, 19 says this. It says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. That is our mandate, correct? It's our mandate to go, therefore, make. How many of you know that the active verb is not go in that, in that scripture? The active verb is not go. The active verb is make disciples. It's literally saying, as you go, make disciples. As you go about your day, as you go about your week, when you're traveling here or traveling there, as you go, make disciples baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In these scriptures, in Matthew 16, in those series of scriptures, Jesus brings us to the beginning strategies of transforming the world around us. Those right there, and I'm going to break them all down for you. Verse 13 says that when Jesus and his disciples came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, we were there several years ago. And um, he said uh, to his disciples, who do men say that I am? Who do men say that the Son of Man is? What's interesting about the, that region, um, it's in the northern region of Israel on the south side of Mount Hermon. And on the south side of Man, Mount Hermon, there's a cave. There's a, there's a specific cave in a, in a series of uh, rocks and streams there and and it's the birthplace it's the birthplace of the Greco-Roman god Pan 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 was half man half goat half man half goat he had the, the goat horns and the goat legs and his upper body was that of that of a man to the ancient Greeks who settled in this area the caves there in Caesarea Philippi was the gate to the underworld it was a literal gate to the underworld, they believed, where for the fertility gods dwelt during the winter, and they also believed that they returned to the earth each spring. So the people also believed that the, that the gate held the gates to Hades, 
the literal gates to Hades. And the pagan worshipers would make sacrifices to Pan right there at the mouth of the cave. If you could throw that picture up there, I have a picture of it. That's the gate of Hades right there. That's the gate of Hades. If you go to the next one, that's what it would look like in Jesus' day. What's significant about this is that Jesus proposed two questions to his disciples standing in the middle of all that, in the middle of uh, uh, people uh, bringing their sacrifices, people worshiping the pagan gods. And he proposed the first one was, who do, you, who do men say that, I, that the Son of Man is? And could it, it could easily be answered, their observation as they traveled with Jesus. How many know that Herod promoted a rumor promoted a rumor. Herod promoted a rumor that Jesus was a, the resurrected John the Baptist. That's why they said, well, some say that you're John the Baptist. Well, Herod started that rumor. So, and it goes on to say, well, one of the other prophets are Jeremiah. And some people believe that Jesus was Elijah, uh, whose anticipated return would be the, the, to announce the coming of the Messiah. And it is significant that Jesus chose to ask this immense question in the middle of all that, right in the middle of it, since there were few areas in the the entire world that were more religious at the time. That place right there, the the gate of Hades is the one to the left there. There was a temple that was erected to the Greek god Pan, and the sacrifices would would take place in there. And there was also the river Benai that would flow out of there, and uh, which eventually would go into the Jordan River. So there were few areas in the entire world that were more religious than that area right there. And Jesus asked the most important question that anybody can ask you is, who do you say that he is? Who do you say that Jesus is? Who is he in your life? This area was filled with temples to the ancient Syrian gods of Baal. Uh, Historians have identified 14 14 such temples right there in that area. And thus, this was a place of, of, of the ancient gods of sacrifice. And just think about it. Jesus standing on a road in an area littered with the temples of Syrian gods, a place where Greek gods looked down, a place where the most important river in Judaism at that time sprang to life, the Benias River, a place where... Uh, the white marble splendor of the home, there was actually a temple that was dedicated to Caesar Augustus himself, a white marbled palace uh, that was used uh, for, for his worship, because how many of you know that those guys believed that they were gods themselves? And, um, and here of all places, of all places that he could have asked this, those questions, he asked them, in that place right there, and he said, who do men say that I am? Who do you say that I am? So they went on to say the answers. And Simon Peter in verse 16 said one of the most profound things that, I mean, he could have easily been killed at that time. Because how many know that Jesus, wherever he went, a crowd came or was attracted. People flocked to where he was. So you know if he's standing in the middle of that where there's goat sacrifices, they even had, uh, I read somewhere where they even had dancing goats that, that would dance and, and at the end of it they'd get sacrifices. Just so weird. It's like a Cirque du Soleil or something like that. It was just crazy stuff. And in the middle of all that, Peter rises up and says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he says this in the middle of Roman controlled pagan worship, where just by him saying that was an automatic death sentence. So he, he, he turns around and he says that. And even Caesar claimed to not only be God, but also a son of God. He even minted his claims of his own divinity on the coins as Pastor Mark was, was, was teaching about. 
Peter uttered these words in Caesarea Philippi, where according to Josephus, the historian, there was a temple to the emperor Augustus there. In verse 17, it says this, Jesus answered and said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I mean, know that this wasn't a slap in, in the face of, of Peter. He wasn't getting on to him. In other words, Jesus was just acknowledging something. He was acknowledging that he, he heard well from the Father. Come on, how many of you want to, Jesus to tell you that, that you heard well from the Father? Blessed are you. You put your name in there. That you heard well from the Father. And he was actually pointing out the good in Peter. You know, I, I, I did this the other day. Um, it's, it's something when, and, and I see it from like a biblical standpoint, but a natural father who points out good in their children. You know, I did this the other day. I, I can't remember what, uh, what happened or what led to it, but Maddox did something kind. And I said, oh, wait, hold on, Maddox. And, and Roman, they were both right there. I said, you know what that was? That was a fruit of the Spirit. That was kindness. That was kindness. I heard somebody say that before, that they would do that with their children. And I started doing it myself. And, um, and the other day, <laughs> I had to point out um, the not-so-fruit of the Spirit stuff <laughs> that was going on because... Uh, an eye for an eye is uh, not a fruit of the spirit, and they and they you know one hits one and then the other one wants to swing at the other one. So, so we point out the father points out these things in our children, the good that is that is that has done the fruits of the spirit that are supposed to come out of us naturally, right? Are supposed to come out of us naturally. Maybe not so naturally for some of us. But should be. Amen. In verse 18 it says, And I also say to you that you are Peter. That you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. That word Peter there means uh, Petros. It's the word Petros in the Greek, which means small rock. And if, if we keep going, and on this rock, that's, that's another word there. It's not the same word. It's the word Petra, which means big rock, which literally talks about the revelation that Peter shared on the side of Mount Hermon in the middle of probably one of the most dangerous areas for a Christian to be at the time, he said, you know what, Peter, that revelation that you, get, that you gave upon this rock, the much bigger rock, and, and I don't know, and I'm, and I'm still trying to figure it out, and maybe we'll never figure it out, but was he, was he making some sort of um, uh, comparison there? Because it, it, it was on the southwest corner of Mount Hermon, and you could see the mountain in the background, and and uh, he, he, he just said, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. In other words, that upon the revelation that, that you just said, Peter, in front of all these people, I'm going to build my church, and on this rock, I'm going to build it. I'm going to build it in front of everybody. I'm going to build it. And I, I want you to think about this here. The church is built on revelation. Think about that for a second. The church is built on revelation. The essence of your faith is that you heard God speak and you responded. The essence of your faith is you heard God speak and you responded. But you might say, man, I've never heard God speak. You can't get saved without hearing God speak. It might not be a literal uh, voice that you hear from the heavens, 
But it could be a tugging of your heart. There's something pulling you towards it. Because there is no salvation apart from hearing God. There isn't. And, and I just want to just share just a side note here about the rock. I was listening to a couple of rabbis. You're like, man, you got a boring life. <laughs> and I, 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 I just pulled some of this from them. And there is, and I've never heard it before. There is a correlation in the Old Testament where Abraham is called the rock on which the world was found. There's an Old Testament correlation where Abraham is known as the rock on which the world was found. And I believe Ju Jesus, standing there in front of his 12 Jewish disciples, He said, hey, boys, there's a new rock that we're going to build this thing on. It's no longer the rock of Abraham. It's going to be this new rock that the ecclesia is going to be built on, that my church is going to be built on. Just a little side note there. Okay, when it talks about the gates, the gates of Hades, it, it wasn't, I think, a wrong interpretation would be the gates of hell. And I don't know, some Bibles, some Bibles, you know, they call it the gates of hell. That's incorrect. Because how many know that the devil is not in hell? Uh, the book of Revelation said that th that place is reserved for him, but that day has not yet come. So the gate of Hades, the gate of Hades, which um, in the ancient world, gates were a defensive structures to keep the enemy out, to keep the enemy out. You know, whenever I read, whenever we would read this, you know, back when, when I still don't know nothing, but when I knew even less, um, I, I would think about it like, man, Jesus and God are going to put a gate up and there's that bad stuff. It's not going to be able to get in there. And uh, it's, it's going to be just a celestial gate that no devil, nothing, no demon, nothing can get through. How many know that that's incorrect? That's incorrect. And because in the ancient world, they were defensive structures to keep the enemy out. But Jesus doesn't want us cowering behind them. When he stated and the gates of hell will not prevail. Jesus was suggesting that those gates should be attacked. Those gates should be attacked. This, this was an offensive uh, force going towards the gates of Hades. Because what he was doing was he was pointing to those 14 uh, pagan buildings, pagan temples that were there. And he said, you know what? Those are the people that's the stuff that I'm going to attack. Those spirits, not, not necessarily people, but the spirits that are controlling those people, those regions, whatever it might be, those are the things that I'm going to go after. The gates of Hades will not have a chance when we go through. So his followers were challenged not to hide from evil, but he commanded to storm the gates of, of Hades, which would not hold up under the triumphant forces of the church of Jesus, of the ecclesia of Jesus. In scripture, gates to a city represented authority. Represents authority. It was where the authority figures of a city would sit. Uh, it didn't represent like a gate to a city, like, like an actual gate to a city, but the authority in the um, uh, demonic realm would be, would be challenged. It would be the authority of a demonic realm would be challenged and would, we would go after it. The hierarchy of those figures of whoever controlled the, uh, the, the gates of that city. It's pretty much talking about the spiritual climate of a city. Those are the gates that Jesus was talking about that we would go after. It's, it's what Paul writes about in Ephesians 6 when he says, For we do not wrestle, wrestle with, with flesh and blood, but 
against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age and all the spiritual uh, hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Do you want to know where the devil is lodged? He's lodged six inches above your head, as Ron Carpenter would say. In the heavenlies. That's where his domain is. That's where, he's, where he rules. And that's the gates that Jesus was talking about. We go after that. Those principalities have no chance when the ecclesia goes after it. And he goes on to verse 19. He says, and the keys of the kingdom. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That's the New King James Version. That's really what I read. But how many know that that translation is not, does not do justice? The, the translation, it really should, said, should say, whatever is already bound in heaven, you can bind here on the earth. And whatever has already been loosed in heaven can be loosed here on the earth. And then what he does, he repeats himself Two chapters later in, in Matthew 18, he repeats himself again, which tells me of the significance of what he's trying to say and what he's trying to tell the, the ecclesia of, of he's leaving these keys to. He's trying to tell them something. He says in Matthew 18, 18, assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth, he says it again. He's trying to flick this in their head. Whatever you bind on earth would already be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth would already be loosed in heaven. And he goes on to say, again, I say to you. And here is where I want to get to. Where two or three are gathered in my name. Agreeing on anything concerning, agreeing on earth concerning anything that I ask. That will be done by my Father in heaven. For two or three are gathered in my name. I am there in the midst. Did you know that the church and only the church has been delegated spiritual authority by Jesus? The church and only the church has been delegated spiritual authority by Jesus. What Adam lost, Jesus restored back to the church, to his church, the ecclesia. You have no spiritual authority without being connected to a church, without being connected to an ecclesia, his bride. Because Jesus and his kingdom is, the only, is only accessible to who he's married to. He's married to the ecclesia. That's who he's married to. That's who his bride is. Jesus and his kingdom is only accessible to those who he's married to. Let me just break down what the ecclesia is. Because he said, I'm, and on this rock I'm going to build my church. That word church is the word ecclesia. And we, we use the term church quite liberally you know it describes a building that we meet in um, at times we use it to describe people we meet we meet with you know oh we met at church but this word is actually a secular term and the Holy Spirit chose it above many of the Hebrew and even the Aramaic terms of that time to describe what he was about to do. Because how many of you know that you don't give the keys to the kingdom just to anybody? How many of you know that Jesus knew that? So there has to be something different in the way I call this, in the way it functions and operates. Because I'm not just going to leave my keys to anybody. You know, I'm just not going to leave my keys to to my house to just anybody. I know you're not either. How many know that Jesus didn't have any side chicks? 
they don't get keys. They get the dirty hotel rooms, you know. But his bride, the one that he's married to, the one that he died for, come on, they get the keys to everything. He could have chose a Hebrew word, but he didn't. I personally believe he made this decision because the secular term was the only one that accurately described his intent. Ekklesia is a Greek word that was initially started out with the Greek and then the Romans kind of took hold of it afterwards. And this is a word that the Holy Spirit used to describe uh, the church on the earth that what he's going to build on. It had been used for centuries in the Greek and the Roman cultures. Uh, it refers to a secular institution operating in the marketplace in governmental capacity. It's a secular term that describes a secular institution operating in the marketplace in governmental capacity. It was not used to describe religious gatherings. Put in another way, he, he was not going to plant his ecclesia within the surrounding systems of government and society in order to impregnate them with the DNA of the kingdom of God. He was going to put it right. That's why he went to, that's why he chose to do that in Caesarea Philippi. He said in the middle of all that chaos of what's going on here, uh, of, of the sacrificing, prostitution, there was even, the, they were even having sex with goats. I mean, it was everything that was going on there. The most vile place that you can go to in pagan worship, the most active religious area place at, the, at that time, 2,000 years ago. And he says, you know what? And, and you know, this is the other thing that kind of just blows me away is that he used that term and everybody around him knew what he was talking about. The ecclesia consists, could consist of a small handful of people, two or three. And together, this small group represented the government of heaven to bring about governmental influence here on the earth. That's why he said where two or three are gathered. You know, we take that and we look at that and we're like, man, that is two or three are gathered. We say that all the time. But I don't think we understand the significance of that. We really don't. We really don't. We don't understand the significance and the weight that that has. The corporate gatherings I know are vital. They're great. I love the corporate gathering. I love uh, the, the, but sometimes something is, oh, hold on, I'm lost here. The corporate gatherings are vital, but they are, they are on to something here. Well, Jesus was on to something. He said, and that something is the governmental representation of the kingdom found in the lives of two or three people, two or three people who are in agreement, where two or three are agree upon something there, impacting the secular institutions in which they were planted in. It's a gathering of two or three people who exist in the marketplace bringing governmental influence. Its capacity for growth was so dynamic that we saw it in Acts 19.10 when Paul was in Ephesus. It was so dynamic in, in those two years. In those two years, Paul reached that region. Re that region exceeded one million people. And it is said in the Bible that he reached all of Asia. You want to know how powerful the ecclesia is? The ecclesia is. It has the ability to reach a million people in two years. You know, we we we. I know we sit there, and I know you're you're thinking that man. That's just that's not. I mean, that's just crazy. But do you know that they're doing that in China right now? They're doing that, and just because they're not doing it here doesn't mean they're not. 
practice like this everywhere. They're doing it in China right now. In Brazil right now, it's being done. It was a spe this, this specific design that Jesus wanted to model the church by, the ecclesia. And he proclaimed that it would overpower the gates of Hades. It was the majority, it was this majority there who would be able to displace the powers of darkness set against God's purposes here on the earth. It was this group of empowered representatives of his kingdom that he said, I'm going to give my keys to these guys. These guys know what's going on. They know how to uh, bind what, what's already bound. They know, what, they know how to loose what's already loose. So these keys, I'm going to give them to them, and also they're married to me. They consider me the most important person in their everyday walk. They consider me above family, above children, above jobs, above businesses, above everything that they could even think of. They consider me above all that. That's who I'm going to give my keys to. That's who has my authority. And those are the people that are going to storm the gates of Hades. Those are the people that understand the power that's within them because when we come together in agreement, do you know that you and Jesus is a majority? You and Jesus is a majority. I believe God is revealing to us the strength of the church. I believe, I believe right now, more than anything, he's forcing us to learn where the strength is during this whole thing. Because we do love large gatherings. We love large gatherings. Who, I mean, who doesn't? You know, and, and large gatherings are significant. They have purpose to them. They're, they're, somebody can release a prophetic word that can um, uh, challenge and, and send forth that whole congregation. It, it, large gatherings are important. But recently we know that strength in numbers, God is forcing us to learn the strength of the church in just two or three people. Two or three gathered, two or three gathered in your own home. I believe that the backbone of the commission for every believer is learning how to partner with God to bring the reality of his reign. The backbone of the commission is for every believer is learning how to partner with God. How to partner, co-labor with God. You know it's a co-mission. You're partnering with somebody. To bring the reality of his reign here on the earth. His dominion into specific areas of our human experience. To bring it into the specific areas of our daily walk. Go therefore and make disciples. As you go make disciples in your everyday doings remember the active verb is make disciples not go as you go make disciples the presence of God is the mark of divine authority the presence of God on a person is, is the mark of divine authority for example the presence of God upon like a married couple, for instance, who, who's in unity before Christ, they carry a governmental responsibility to represent him and to bind here, to bind here what is not free up there and to loose here what is loosed up there. The presence of God upon a married couple Walking together in unity in Christ, they carry the governmental responsibility to represent him here on the earth and to bind here on the earth what is bound in heaven and to loose here on the earth what is loosed in heaven. 
It is a God-given mandate and responsibility. It is the backbone of our assignment to disciple nations. That's a heck of a word right there, disciple nations. Disciple nations. Hey, that's, he said it. He said it in his word, disciple nations, really? If a million people can be reached in a region in, in, in Asia, if Paul, one man, can reach one million people in two years, come on, man, what, what in the world are we doing? And, and I'll be the first to raise my hand guilty. I'll be the first. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not up here. I, I'm probably just preaching to myself because I know you guys are reaching people in your everyday walk, and that's great. But you know what? I believe that there is a, a greater mandate on our lives to push this thing forward, to storm the gate of Hades. Listen, man, I, I can just imagine Jesus standing in that pagan square on the southwest corner of Mount Hermon in front of all those temples, sacrifices going on. Whatever else is, you know, everything else going, prostitution, everything else going on. And him to declare how he's going to build his church. And he did it all as a son of man. We were designed and assigned by God to be on this planet as citizens of another world. And as citizens of that world, I'm to look for the one or two others that I can meet with and come to a place of agreement so that the manifested presence of God will settle upon our gathering and together in that position we make decisions that actually shape the course of history. What does that position look like? It's found in John 15. John 15, verse 7 and 8, you know, it talks about I'm the, the true vine. But I just want to just get these two scriptures. If you abide in me, man, it's already 12 o'clock. Come on, Lord. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask for what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so that you will be my disciples. The fruit in this context is answer to prayer. In that context, the word fruit in there is an answer to prayer. So I owe God answers to prayer. The lack of answers to prayer is not on his end of the equation. The lack of answers to prayer is on my end of the equation. And it is connected to my ability and my willingness to abide. The felt presence of God is the absolute key to continuous answers to prayer. Living apart from that reality causes you to miss the mark. You'll pray prayers out of your own human desires, out of your own emotions. I mean, and I know sometimes there's nothing wrong with that, but you'll miss it. We're missing the strength of abiding. That's what we're actually what we're doing. Because I put myself above him when we do that. Do you realize that? When we miss the abiding, the strength of abiding, it, we're literally putting ourselves above him. Because when you have manifested the presence of Jesus upon you and you come before the Father with requests, you know what? You got a sense of clout. Like, I got something here. I, oh, I, kn I know what he's going to say. Because we have been invited into it. We have been invited into it. Abide in me. And my words abide in you. What is that? It's the acknowledged, felt presence of God. It's not God is here and I'm over there. Abiding is it's an engagement. It's a participation with a person there is this encounter there is this coming together there is this exchange 
There's this fellowship. There's this intimacy. It's what Paul talks about. I want to know him. It's the Greek word gnoskos. The only word picture that I can think of is a man and a woman who've been married for 60 years. They just know each other. I want to know them. There's this connection, and that connection, I'm positioned to think different, to feel different, to see different. And as I sit there with other representatives of the ecclesia, and in that context, the weight of the government is upon your shoulders. And from that position, you can bind whatever is already bound up there. You can loose whatever is already loosed. That's what I mean, you have some clout. Because you have been so together in such an intimate way that you know what? You know the heart of the Father. No ifs, ands, buts about it because you know what? Your desires, His desires actually become your desires. His way of thinking becomes your way of thinking. And in that position, we are much more prone to see and discern the reality of that world. Those king, keys of the kingdom that he's talking about are only found in abiding. You want to have access to this, access to that. But I think what Jesus is really asking us is, where you been? So what does that mean for our area? Do you know that demonic controlled areas, regions, they can be locked down because one person or persons that partnered with the demonic and it needs to be broken off of them. It could be one person, it could be two people, it could be a whole group of people, but they've partnered with something that is not of Jesus. They partnered with a demonic realm and an area or a region can be controlled or locked down. Can I give you an example? The man at the Gadareans. I know Matthew says it was two guys, but the other guys say it was one. The guy there, or those guys, did not let anybody come through. He was so demonically possessed that he ran everybody out. Nobody could even go there. But, I mean, you know that when Jesus walks up to the situation, because he already knows, he already knows whatever is bound in heaven, bound on here on the earth and whatever is loosed in heaven will be loosed here on the earth. Sometimes we, we bind things here and it's all great, but we never loose anything. There's got to be a loosing after the, bound, the binding. And that's what he does here for this guy or these guys. And he's, you know, as you know, they, the, the, it goes into the pigs and they run off the cliff. But how many of you know that at the end of that chapter, um, how many know that the people were so um, taken back by uh, a greater power than what that guy had that they were so afraid and they asked him to leave? It's in your Bible. They asked him to go because they did not understand how was there a greater power than that guy there. We saw this. This guy was a lunatic. He was crazy. But how many of you know that you put a little bit of leaven into a lump of dough and it affects the whole thing? It affects everybody. It affects everything. Because Jesus came back. He came back to that area all because of this one or two guys who were transformed. And the whole area, the whole region was opened up to him. The whole region was. It was opened to the ecclesia of Jesus. It was opened up to him. Because we need to live more aware of what he wants. 
So what's our responsibility in all this? Jesus said that we have this ecclesia where two or three work. Say, for instance, they work at Walmart. And when they take their lunch break and come together in Jesus' name, they automatically become an ecclesia. And they come together in Jesus' name and have this predetermined idea that we will partner together for the invasion of God's blessing and presence on this business that I don't even own. A business that I'm here as a representative of another world. The government of God rests on those two or three people. But let me, get, let me tell you this, not just the government, but the governor himself is in that place. Because if I'll connect my heart with his and think the way he thinks and, and want what he wants and dream what he dreams, and as that abiding presence becomes that kind of influence in my conscience and, and, and subconscious and unconscious mind, I can ask anything of God. That's what Matthew 18 tells us. Ask anything in my name because when there is such unity with you and Jesus just like a married couple that have been married for 60, 70 years they just know each other they know what to ask each other they know if they ask their spouse they know what the answer is going to be they know what the response is going to be that's what that means I can ask anything. That's what he's telling his ecclesia. And like I said, God plus you is a majority. God plus you is a majority. Last scripture, and I'm done. How many know the scripture Romans 8:28? We all know it, we all quote it. Can I give you a little bit of context behind it? It says, and we know that all things work together for good to the, those who, who love God, to those who are called according to his purposes. We quote it all the time when bad stuff happens. Man, we know God's going to turn it around. Right before that scripture, right before that scripture, the Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf. And do you realize right after that scripture, Romans 8, 28, it's Jesus that intercedes on our behalf? That's why all things work together. You have the Holy Spirit and Jesus in the middle of Romans 8, 28, interceding on your behalf. That is the only reason Romans 8, 28 works. Learning what they are praying is the key to our ongoing continual breakthrough in prayer. Holy Spirit, Jesus, learning what they are praying, what they are interceding on your behalf about or on behalf of the ecclesia, ecclesia here at New Harvest Church, learning what they are praying is the key to our ongoing continual breakthrough. It is supposed to be that the will of God invades the earth for no other reason than because we pray. And I heard this the other day. You know where revival starts? It starts in your home. It does not start in the church. It starts in your home. One of the most powerful scriptures that I think I've, I've read, I shouldn't rank it that high, but maybe I should, is at the end of Philippians, the book of Philippians, when Paul says, the household of Caesar greets you. It's one of the most powerful scriptures I've ever read. That the influence of Paul, because he was abiding with something greater than him, and his dreams became his dreams, the way he thought was the way he thought. Everything, it was gnoskos. He knew him. 
that influence carried into the household of Caesar. If you, if there's no comparison when you talk about evil, when it comes to the Caesars of that day. I mean, you think of the, the, the worst of the worst has no comparison to the Caesars of that day. And he made it to the household of Caesar. He says, the household of Caesar greets you. I just want everybody to stand. I don't want to do an altar call. Just right where you're at. I just want to just declare that my house is an altar. If you want to just say your address, whatever it is, my house is an altar. My wife, my kids, we're an ecclesia. Because we have come together in unity. In an undeniable abiding presence of God. And we bind whatever is already bound in heaven. And we loose whatever has already been loosed on the earth. So let's just take the next 30 seconds. Come on, just declare that over your life, over your home, that you know what? This bigger ecclesia called New Harvest Church, I thank God for it. It's the church that he died for. Come on, it's his bride. But when we go into our home, there's nothing more powerful than our house. The most powerful house in, in this country is not the White House. The most powerful house in this country is your house. If your house has the abiding presence of Jesus Christ the Almighty, and you know him, you know you good, it's the word gnosko, so you know him. You know him, Christ and Christ crucified. That is the most powerful house in this country. We just thank you for it. Come on, as Pastor Porter begins to sing, let's just raise our voice, raise our hands, and acknowledge the King of kings and the Lord of lords for a deeper, a deeper touch.
We're the ecclesia. Jesus went on to give them further instructions. And when you go, cast out devils, heal the sick, and raise the dead. And these signs shall follow them that believe. Amen. I believe when you go to work tomorrow, you ought to be casting out some devils. You ought to be healing the sick. Amen. I'm telling you, that's, that's, that's the mark of the ecclesia. These signs shall follow them that believe. And the gates of hell, Hades, the underworld, will not be able to prevail against the ecclesia. Amen. Come on, let's give God praise for that word. Pastor Carlos, thank you. Amen. Amen. Don't forget, tomorrow night, we're going to be praying. I mean, Tuesday night, Tuesday night. I'll, I'll figure out what day I'm in in a minute. Tuesday night, it's our, our prayer time together. It's our corporate prayer time. That's where we shake the gates of hell right there. That's where we, that's where it gets shooken. So, uh, shooken, that's a word, shooken. That's my word. <laughs> we shooken and shooken the gates of hell. But just, uh, if, if, if you can, I, I just want to always invite people to be at our prayer time. There's something dynamic that happens when people gather to pray in the same direction. Amen. So we just want to be there for that. And then, uh, of course, next Sunday morning, we'll kick it back off again. And we're just going to believe God for an amazing time. Listen, the gates of hell are being shaken because the church is coming. The church is rising. The church is on a mission. Amen. Let me pray over you. Father, I thank you this morning for the people of God today. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our lives. And Lord, we just continue to thank. Lord, I even heard Viva pray this morning. Lord, we continue to pray over our nation. Lord, that the church would rise in our nation. And Lord, that we would stand for truth. We would stand for righteousness. That we would be the people. We would be the ecclesia. We would be salt and light. We'd be a city set on the hill. Lord, we'd be different, other than something that the people can look to. Father, we just thank you today. Lord, we thank you for the word of God today. Thank you, Lord, that our hearts have been stretched. Our spirit has been nurtured today, Lord. Revelation has come today. And Father, we just give you the praise and the glory. I speak a blessing over your people today. Lord, bless them coming in and bless them going out. Lord, let everything that their hands touch cause it to prosper and be blessed. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody together said amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you in Jesus' name.